Okay, welcome to the podcast. Uh, we're here at Super Chief Gallery. It's September 2023, and we're preparing for our next exhibition, Uncommon Bonds, uh, with these four very talented, fine artists with roots in graffiti. Um, can I ask you guys to introduce yourselves, starting with you, Trav? Yeah, my name's Trav, and I'm here to party. My name is uh, Joseph Top, uh, also known as Rhyme, R-I-M-E. I am Victor Reyes. Uh, I've been a painter for 30 years. Uh, started with graffiti, and now I just paint everything. I'm George Ewok, and yeah, let's do this. Thank you, guys. Uh, I, I guess I just want to start with the title of the show, Uncommon Bonds. Uh, the four of you uh, knowing each other through your connections as graffiti writers for the past uh, 20-ish years and your journey from uh, just bombing in the streets to, to careers in fine art. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the uncommon bonds that link you guys together and uh, your concept for coming up with the exhibition? Is that me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, you, I think <laughs> yeah, primarily yeah. So, this is the question for you. <laughs> so for me, I, I kind of rattled around with a few different title options and then I kind of shot some options to the group. And then we kind of settled on uncommon bonds. For me, what the what the title meant was just kind of through graffiti as you uh, explore life and whatever, you come across relationships and people from different backgrounds or whatever ethnicities. And you're kind of like blinded by like the societal kind of categories through graffiti. If, if, if you link with somebody that paints graffiti, uh, they're, they're like your tribe, no matter what, or what other differences you have outside of that. And that was kind of like the, the initial concept. But then as I kind of started, uh, diving deeper into the title, once we selected on it, there's, there's like bonds that we make with different tools and things to like make art. Um, you get relationships with different places that you explore in graffiti, like, um, you know, just different places that, that graffiti can take you to that you would have never otherwise went to. And then also just friends, people, places, things. Yeah. In terms of uh, bonds, how did you guys meet? Uh, obviously, you're all members of the same crew. You're like members of the MSK graffiti crew. Uh, can you tell me maybe like... Well, I'll say that uh, the, the title Uncommon Bonds, uh, it made me think about like that there's a, there's, in, in, in our crew, MSK, there's a very diverse, uh, there's many different versions of, of, uh, of, of how to approach uh, uh, mark making uh, or graffiti. Um, and like, if you think of like all the different people in our crew, uh, there's some people that are very different, you know, like if you were to compare like uh, what Ewok does to say push or somebody like that or or Zess or, 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 or some of these people uh, that they're, they're uh, contrasting approaches. But I think that there is an overall aesthetic that our crew is known for, like even though it seems different, it, I think that there is a shared aesthetic standard that comes from just uh, being under the sort of uh, same umbrella uh, as, as MSK. Would, does that make any sense? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, um, I think it's, it's kind of a merit-based approach. And so I think a lot of the people that are involved have been involved for a considerable number of years. So it's akin to something like a school or like a philosophy and there's not really a right way to do it but there's clearly a wrong way to do it and i think everyone just has such deep roots into it it's this weird wave that is after the second or the after the new york wave of graffiti la gets it off in like the 80s and the 70s but it's not like huge and then this crew comes along and it gets huge and it goes international and it's like, it's just this weird space between things. Kind of like right when hip hop goes mainstream in the eighties. Um, but it's not hip hop based. It's more like 
punk or metal or you know Latino culture of California or something like that but um, it's it's a it's a really unique thing and it, I think it just emanates from that point interesting and I agree with you I think yeah seeing uh, the transition of graffiti culture from New York to LA in that late 80s, early 90s, you saw LA take phenomenal leaps in the innovation of that style and, uh, um, and, de and the development of graffiti from there. Um, Ewok, uh, what does the, the show concept on Common Bonds mean to you? I just learned about what the, <laughs> what the theme behind the name was. I thought somebody just came up with it and we all agreed. Uh, I didn't know like the, but I mean, I, I, I resonate with what Trav said about, um, and I, I've kind of come to this conclusion on my own also, like there's a certain power to different subcultures in particular, graffiti being one of them. I think, um, you know, different avenues of like hip hop music or even some sports like, you know, basketball culture, like street basketball, um, you know, even stuff that's stuff like death metal like I, I i really appreciate people's ability to kind of like collaborate within a certain lane and create something and and kind of be um feed off of that energy and also contribute back to that energy and i think like i think that's kind of like the essence of what at least what i got out of what Trav was saying is like there's these cultures that are so attractive if you find like if somebody finds um graffiti or hip-hop music or whatever at the right time in their life and it really speaks to them it just becomes like part of you you know and and i think we kind of all got sucked into that at some point you know and and I, here we are you know i think that's that's what i get out of it at least <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, did any of you guys find yourself arrive at graffiti through the entry point of another subculture? Where like, were, were you into punk first, or did you like find your way to graffiti through breakdancing or, or or some other kind of subculture first, or were were you pretty? For for me, <clears throat> I kind of had a parallel subculture, in a sense. I mean, I guess you could call it a subculture, but it was shoplifting. <laughs> I had, I grew up very poor, so I had friends that were into that. And then, you know, I noticed graffiti, but I, it's one of these things for me that like, I, I genuinely can't tell which came first, like the chicken or the egg, like, cause it was very parallel in my life. But it, it, it yeah, I, I don't know if, if that came first or not, but that was one for me. Racking. Yeah. yeah. Were you racking paint too? Or you I mean, I had to, racking? cause yeah. I was underage. So that's kind of like also what what's what spawned that but yeah i don't know i don't know about you guys i i don't think i practiced any of the elements of hip-hop or anything like that <laughs> when i got into graffiti uh i like to draw as a kid and um i saw graffiti in in my neighborhood or places i visited uh, uh growing up in new york city and just being someone that was attracted to art already uh independently drawing the cartoons i liked and stuff like that uh i just wanted to try it i i just became um uh, fascinated by it um and it wasn't until i had the ability to sort of uh sneak away from the controls of of, of parental figures or anything like that that i that i made the the effort to uh find spray paint and start uh giving attempts at it and i just found it to be very thrilling and it kept my interest in art alive that i feel might have dwindled away with my interest in watching saturday morning cartoons you know like art i think for many children it it, it it's it's very active early on and then it just sort of fades away as they fall into the pressures of becoming an individual uh graffiti kept that spirit alive in me and i kind of listened to some rap music uh i didn't buy cds or 
tapes or anything. I listened to the radio. Uh, I didn't break dance. I liked to ride bikes. Like I had a GT and a Haro. And you had a Haro? I had a Haro and it got stolen. I had a diamond back. Yeah. Uh, uh, I like to play handball and sometimes I would write on handball courts uh, and I would take the train and I would want my name to be on the train track so that I could see it when I go to school. Nice. Um, so yeah, so it was just my, my interest in art was uh, the inspiration to get into graffiti. And I always thought that they were different because uh, I, you know, graffiti was introduced to me as, uh, as, as outside of uh, the accepted understanding of what art is. And of course, we've all, you know, done our best to uh, make it clear that what we do is indeed a uh, commendable and respectable art form. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense uh, that, that you were just artistically inclined, seeing the way it expressed yourself in your graffiti as someone that integrates so many characters and so much freeform expression into their style. Yeah, the, the, way, I, the way I paint or draw now, you, you could see the, the look before I even attempted graffiti is very similar. I just Frankensteined all the cartoons I liked from coloring books in the back of uh, newspapers and all that. Um, I didn't come from an artistic family like of, of painters or anything. I, I just li I just liked it and I just did it and I still doing it. Yeah, uh, similar background. Grew up uh, like you know lower middle class. You know nothing destitute, but just wasn't an art family. You know people <laughs> were just concerned to make it ends meet. And uh, I was in Wisconsin, and then I, I reached an age where my mom, she was a single mom. She was like, I can't deal with this kid anymore, so I had to go move in with my dad, who was in Southern California. And this was like in '88, '89, and uh, and. It was like South Orange County, which was like a culture shock, being from, from like Milwaukee. And uh, it was just weird. And it wasn't really anything for years, aside from materialism, everyone being really wealthy and the beaches and the surfer kids. And then one day I'm walking home from school and I walk under this underpass that I see out of the corner of my eye. And I, I find a piece, like the first piece of graffiti I've ever seen in like this white picket fence, like suburbia, you know? Like you can't walk down the street without the cops pulling you over. And I. The piece I see is an AWR piece. It's like a tight AWR piece. And this guy's like, you don't know it, but he's mixing colors with WD-40 tips. And like, it's just graphic and it jumps off the wall. And I must have spent an hour if I spent five minutes looking at it, just standing there transfixed. And I had this like out of body, like timeless experience where I was like, I saw my future and I was like, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And, uh, and my dad was trying to be an entrepreneur. And so he was telling me to like find things that, you know, find find needs that people want served. And I didn't really understand what he meant, but I, but I came home and I told him, I was like, listen, man, I, I saw this thing and it's like electric. And it was like, it was like, you know, people hearing the Beatles for the first time, everyone wanted to go around and get a, a guitar and start a band. But I was like, listen, the future is, is visual art. I didn't really know what to call it, but I was like, it's this stuff. And, and it's like, it just moves and it's, it has this thing to it. And, um, and like everything in the future is going to have this everything like you're not going to be able to like walk five feet without seeing it. And he's like you're crazy and he's like you'll go to jail for that and I was like yeah that's beside the point <laughs> and I was like I was like listen like what's going on at school is bullshit it's like it's nothing it's, they're not teaching you anything this is something this is like real life and he was like I, 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 yeah, I don't know I think you know he just kind of wrote it off but I from that moment on I was like not paying attention to anything in school drawing as you spent all that time drawing i couldn't draw and i think within a year i had met tyke and his brother summit and probably like a year and a half after that i met the rest of the crew and uh what year was that that was 1994 or 1993 that's when so you by, saw that piece yeah so by 95 <laughs> i was up and running and and that was it that was the breadcrumb i needed that was like the rabbit hole and, uh, and like you know I still don't know how I knew that, but I did. So did you just start writing graffiti seriously from that moment, or? or well, I mean, as seriously as like a fourteen-year-old kid. Was like, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I I was like school, no, like that's that's a waste of time. Self-education is where it's at. This is a form of self-education. Uh, I think the the nut of it was, or the core of it was, was like 
this is this is self permission. This is self sovereignty. You know, this is like school is like a way of getting permission from the institution. And like at fourteen, I was like, I don't know. And, and being in South Orange County, I was like, I don't know if I trust this institution. Like, you know, I want to get underneath the cracks of this thing and see what's what. And it, you know, speaking to everyone's points, like it's just an interesting way to view the world. You just see, it's like be it's the ultimate backstage pass because you know you're underneath things. You're in industry. You're in different institutions. You're, you're just kind of everywhere at once, you know. And it's a uh, it's just a different way to think. It's always been my main attraction to graffiti and uh, and working with graffiti artists is it's the ultimate unpretentious form of artwork. And and I've always had a, a problem with the pretentiousness of the art establishment or the academic art establishment. Uh, to be a graffiti artist goes to show that you are, can think outside the box and, and, and carve your own path and uh, subvert, ultimately subvert for the purposes of art and expression. Yeah. Yeah. It's the ultimate democratic performance. Yeah. Um, what? Sorry, I was going to give you a chance to, to tell his story. Oh, I thought you were. <laughs> Go ahead, Ryan. What, 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 what do you have to say about um, that, uh, Georgie Walker? He has a bond. We have a bond right here because if you tell your story, I bet you it, it matches up with mine somehow. Pretty much, yeah. yeah, yeah. I am uh, also from Wisconsin. I, I was born in Tennessee, but every memory of my life was from Wisconsin forward. Um, Go Packers, by the way. <laughs> also... Um, yeah, I, I kind of always was drawing and, and, you know, doing some kind of art from the time I was a little kid. My mom could never keep any kind of like writing utensils or pens, pencils, because I would just hoard them all and, and use them for stuff. I would, you know, be in my bedroom when I was supposed to be sleeping, preparing for school or whatever. I would be under the covers with like a flashlight, like doing pencil drawings and <laughs> weird shit like that. Uh, I think probably, and I, you know, there was a couple of instances where I would see graffiti in different contexts. It was usually like going through Chicago or, you know, if I would travel outside, there wasn't a lot of graffiti cracking in, in Wisconsin until like maybe the early to mid nineties, at least as far as I was aware of. Um, but when I would see just these random instances of graffiti, either like on a box truck or you know, I, I remembered seeing a mural on one of the, I think it's the Dan Ryan freeway in Chicago. It's like, it's in between the, um, there's a elevated subway that goes in between both sides of the freeway. And I remembered seeing somebody had painted, I think it was a piece. I don't really remember the letters, but I remember there was like a cop character chasing what I would presume was probably a graffiti writer. I mean, I saw this when I was like eight or nine years old. And I just thought it was the coolest fucking thing. And something about graffiti always just like jumped out at me. Like it captivated me, like even more so than any other kind of art. Even like I remember seeing uh, the beginning of what was it? Uh, Welcome back, Cotter. Yeah, they would have all that. the they yeah. would have all the B-roll of just like New York stuff. Yep. And there was something with some of like the old school like subway art like graffiti like some trains like pulling into a yard or something that had graffiti on them and i would always just wait for that part you know like i would kind of like be zoned out but when i would hear the music for the intro of the show i would be like oh when's the train coming up and this is when i was like five six i don't know what it was about graffiti but i knew it was something important I didn't understand anything about it i don't think i could read what any of the letters said or any of that stuff i just kind of knew like people painted this with like spray paint and it was on subway cars and it just was captivating to me. So then like fast forward to when I was in high school, I remember sitting behind this kid, his name is Pedro Vasquez. And uh, he, uh, he was doing these kind of like cholo script, like letters on his, on his paper, just like doodling during class. And I just thought it was so cool. I, I kept like looking at it and I would go home and try and do my own crappy versions of it. And then I remembered seeing, I think when I first really started seeing graffiti in a way that was more accessible to me, it was through skateboarding. That was kind of the culture that 
I would say maybe exposed me to graffiti a little more and also kind of ran parallel with graffiti just in terms of, you know, kind of the illegality based on how things were at the time and kind of just this subculture that's sort of shat on by the majority. I mean, a lot of like younger kids probably wouldn't know this, but there was a time where skateboarding was not popular, was not cool. And, you know, like you had to run from cops and, you know, find your spots. So I think in in that regard, there was a lot of parallels and similarities to skateboarding culture. And, uh, you know, I was doing both for a while. Like when I went away to college, that's when I really fell like deep into um, graffiti. Just I moved to Minneapolis and I ended up seeing kind of what was the beginning of the scene that was happening there. And it just I just went for it. You know, like it just it, that was the right time because I was away from my parents and I was able to have, you know, enough freedom to just kind of experiment with this thing and see where it took me. So, so yeah. Minneapolis is where you got serious about graffiti? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I thought I was doing graffiti before I went away to school, but it was just dumb shit. Like, I didn't really know what I was doing. I feel, I feel like I find like when I moved to Minneapolis, I knew like, OK, this is a tag. This is a throw up. This is a piece. I think before that, it was all kind of just this random uh, mishmash of stuff that you were writing on shit, you know, like I didn't. I didn't know all the ins and outs of the the terminology or the differentiations between, you know, bubble letters and pieces and tags. It was just all graffiti to me. So I would say probably around 92 was when I started, like in Minneapolis. A uh, question for the group is, uh, what do you think was the moment where you felt like you had uh, gotten good at graffiti and uh, esta- kind of established your style and, and started growing into your style? For, for me like i'm really really hard on myself and like no matter what i do i'll find something i don't like about it and i'll let it in not like in a negative way uh, it, like i try to like just in a way of like for me i'm always kind of battling with myself trying to get a little bit better e- each approach whether it's uh whether it's painting graffiti or making art like i just kind of like focus on every aspect of what I'm doing and constantly look for ways to improve. And I think that's what I love about uh, painting in general, whether it's graffiti or anything. It's like, so for me, I don't, I don't know, there's things I like more and there's things I like less, uh, but I don't ever really look at it like I'm good or I'm bad. I look at it like, what do I like? What don't I like? Where can I take it? That's kind of just the way I approach creating in general. Uh, I think, yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's that's it for me. I, f- well, for me, w- what we were saying before, I think before graffiti, I really liked trespassing. <laughs> I, I know, but we used to play hide and seek and manhunt and exploring and... And uh, we just liked the idea of like climbing up onto a building or getting into some place and hanging out there doing something. Hey, real and, quick, you you're really good at trespassing. <laughs> <laughs> like no, we but, painted that trackside in New York, and I was I I noticed I saw a different side of you, <laughs> where we like went in and we climbed down the like ledge and like we were like don't step on that rail or whatever. Like you yeah. were like sneaking through, and it it's was fun. like it you're fun. you're. I never like. I always see you as like, you know, like, <laughs> like kind of goofy Joseph. <laughs> fun. But like when I like I saw you in like stealth Joseph criminal mode. Oh. <laughs> You're really really good at it. Well, no, I I like. I think I like that. I like. I think that graffiti has this wonderful way of um, of 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 letting you know that rules are optional. Um, and it did something to not completely break our spirits as adults. Um, but yeah, graffiti just gave me the opportunity not only to go to places that, you know, maybe we're not, you're not allowed to be in or, or see the world from different vantage points or something like that, but also to leave something behind. And for me, uh, the idea of, of, of measuring where I stood in the eyes of, of, of the people who saw my graffiti, 
I'd say it'd be more about how it made me feel. And and I, I think that for all of us, uh, we enjoy a bit of challenge. Uh, I don't think any of us are constantly reproducing a stamp. There has to be a journey. There has to be something further that you're reaching for to keep you interested. Um, so for me, I, I'd say that graffiti was just something that made me feel uh, excited and fascinated by it. Uh, it, it. It helped me to understand photography, you know, to take pictures of, of your graffiti. I, I had a 110 camera and then I had a 35 millimeter camera. And, and um, then I had a photo album of my graffiti and I would study and stare at a picture for 15 minutes and it would give me the inspiration to to draw a plan maybe of of something else that I might do and in my in my peer group I was the better person of my friends but I wasn't that great maybe in the grand scheme of graffiti but I was always amongst people maybe who who were not artists to begin with and just liked the idea of doing graffiti. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's just been a lot of different phases of how we measure ourselves up to the world and maybe there might be a respectable standard or a breakthrough that comes at different phases of, of, of our development. But uh, I would say that I'm still learning and I'm still interested. Uh, there's still, um to me to me i'm doing it right when the first half of my graffiti piece i have a great deal of self-doubt that it's going to work out uh that i think that oh maybe it's the end of the road for me maybe everybody was joking that my stuff is okay <laughs> you know uh i'd say about 65 percent in you, i'm overcoming a lot of that self-doubt uh and then like once you get up to that peak, it's kind of like hiking, you know, once you get up to that, to that, you, you could see the peak, you could see the end of it and you say, okay, I know how I can bring this thing home. It's at that point that you, your, your confidence sort of builds up. And then it's that last, once I reach 100%, I was saying this to Georgia and Minneapolis, uh, once I reach 100% on, uh, whether it be a painting or a, a piece of graffiti, I've developed a standard of, of always adding a minimum of 20% of extra. So it's like going to a sit down restaurant. I'm not just going to pay the bill. I'm also going to leave a 20% tip at minimum. And that's my standard. And I think that uh, our crew MSK, we have a professionalism in what we're doing, whether it be uh, legal or not, to take things a bit further, to, to leave that generous tip whether it involves money or not, or, 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 or time or not, or whatever the case is. Um, so yeah, I, I think there must be a challenge. There must be self-doubt. There must be uh, a stubbornness to resolve anything that you do. Uh, I don't leave any pieces undone unless I can't do anything about it. And it helped me a lot to learn how to be an adult. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a problem to follow. But uh, yeah, just speaking to that, like finishing graffiti pieces is hard. They're very physically demanding. Even like I work, I do crazy workouts, and like mm -hmm. if you don't paint for a while and you go paint a piece, mm -hmm. legal, illegal, whatever, it's like it's a commitment. Mm -hmm. Your work is so physical as well like the way you you apply mark making and composition you know you it's 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 very big and it's 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 very bold yeah yeah, yeah. you know yeah 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 it's it's this it scales up yeah yeah so it's like but you know it's just like anything else you need to get your chops but i think the t the t like i started in 93 and i got i stopped giving myself a hard time about what other people thought in like 95 and, or not 95 uh, 2005 2006 about like 11 years in I, I just was like really comfortable with what I was doing whether I did good or I did bad like 
you know, I would still be like, that's not your best effort, you know, or like, that's not, but I just got comfortable with the idea of lesser works, you know, if you do anything, there's a law of averages or a median and, uh, you know, I just was like, this is a winner. This one's, some people will like it. And I stopped caring about what people thought, you know, which is the most freeing thing. And then you're just left with your own kind of thoughts or passions or demons or whatever you want to call it. But, uh, yeah, like around then I, I started to get pretty free and give myself permission to just do what I wanted to do, regardless of like whether or not it was like copacetic to what the like lexicon of graffiti is, you know? And that's when I started to get like real loose with it and just do whatever. And some people loved it and some people didn't like it, but like, you know what I mean? It was like, I had the sweat equity. So like, it's like, so I built this building that you don't like, like I'm going in. <laughs> like, don't look at it. I don't know. What do, you want, what do you want me to tell you? You know, it was like, I, I was comfortable being the architect, you know, I had done like 11 years or something. And I think that's like a weird thing that's gone now because it graffiti so mainstream and there's so much reference out there. And essentially everyone just starts pretty pretty good because the collective conscious is so big now that it's like, and, and more power to them, I'm like not mad at it. I'm just saying like, you know, I spent like four or five years just like not understanding, like like you just build a tag and then, and then extrapolate off that, you know? Mm -hmm. Like throwing an outline on something or a stroke on something in Illustrator. Um, took me like you know, 11 years to get there. But, like, I'm so happy I took that journey. I, I don't know today, like, you know, maybe people get there faster, but maybe it goes just as fast. You know what I mean? I don't know. I think the challenge, though, is, like, it, it's vital because it you you get to make it your own. Yeah. You know? If you're downloading a font or you're, you're like, oh, I like I like the MQ throw up. I think I'll, I'll make my own MQ throw up. It's like, you know, MQ made his own MQ throw up. Like, he was the chicken or the egg or whatever. You know, he was the big bang of his idea, you know, and then like he's making little universes everywhere unintentionally. And that's not bad. That's growth. But I'm just saying like, what about the first one? You know, like building those first ones, like, you know, it's like, ah, I'm going to make a hot rod like that guy made. But it's like, what about the first person that decided to make a hot rod or like, you know, modified an engine with a header or something, you know, like that kind of craft is what I'm interested in making the tools to make the things you want to make. Well, what was the or original question that we're answering now? I, I think it's devolved into you kind of just explaining your, uh, your journey through graffiti and, and innovating and experimentation. Was, wasn't it something about like, when did you first think that you, your stuff was good? The, the original yeah. question was, when did you Do go you from- Do you think your stuff is good? I, I, there's no absolute good in my mind, especially when it applies to my own stuff. I think some things I do are better than others, but I'm never like, oh, it's good. You know, cause I feel like that's when you get into this sort of like Bill Maher self-satisfied <laughs> kind of, you know, like you're just, you're full of yourself and you think you're the shit. Self-aggrandizing. And that's when you start falling off. Like I, I, I don't think of good as like an absolute like you know, level that you achieve and you just remain that, I feel like you gotta constantly work at maintaining whatever level of uh, proficiency that you bring to the table. And I think in my mind, good is always on the horizon, you know, no matter where, where I'm at at the moment, there's people that are doing like way more interesting stuff, way better stuff. You know, I feel like it, sometimes I'm even still trying to catch up to the shit that like, you know, 13 year olds were doing in New York subway tunnels back in 86, like certain nuances of that. I just missed it, you know, like I wasn't there. Um, but I, you know, I it, it blows my mind that these like teenagers developed like basically the, the blueprints and the DNA of all the stuff that's like come after that, including like all the stuff that we're doing. And the fact that, that some of it a lot of it still holds up and still has like a really cool energy and integrity to it, you know, 30, 40 years later, like that's insane to me. I, I felt like, I mean, I, I, as far as answering the question in the most direct way, I felt like I was never like one to like pat myself on the back too much, but I felt like 
when I started developing my own kind of style that was not derivative of something or at least something in graffiti, I felt like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm doing something that's kind of interesting. You know, I'm, I always want to like sharpen it and improve it. But like when I was doing a lot of uh, kind of textural stuff and a lot of like airbrushy technique stuff, I was like, oh, this is, you know, I, I'm kind of like putting my stamp on something. Cause I think from the beginning, my, um, my goals with graffiti was to contribute to it. You know, I felt like the stuff that I looked at that inspired me to want to do graffiti, I want to give back to the, you know, the, the gene pool of graffiti and maybe something I do will inspire somebody to do, you know, their own thing or give them permission to kind of explore something that's uh, off the beaten path or expanding the envelope. Um, so I think, you know, yeah, I, I, I never think of good as like an absolute. There's always better out there. And, and that's kind of what I'm pursuing. But I don't think any of us probably feel like, oh, we made it. We're good now. Like, we don't have to keep keep working. I think it's just there's always more. Yeah. If you were to look at if you were to look at like let's say that in 1998 you painted at Paint Lewis you you painted part of your piece on a raw wall would if you were to look at that piece would you cringe at that piece or would no you I like that piece still yeah because I like that piece a lot too yeah. I don't I don't like a lot of my pieces but I like that one like that I felt like it had very, an energy yeah. even there was some stuff that was kind of wonky and, and like stuff that I wouldn't do now. But I felt like it captured like an energy from that time that I think was was good. Yeah, I think that if if I, you know, I said what I said, but I think that my rhythm of being good would be if I could look at something of mine from 20 years ago and see that it still holds up by whatever aesthetic is standard I've developed in the present moment. Uh, because there are some chances that we take, uh, especially in our early years of painting, where we're just taking risks or we're going down paths where we don't, we're getting lost in it. And some things hold up and some things don't. Um, I think that for me, like, uh, maybe in the, in the, but then again, there's some things that we were doing that maybe were in style. You know, uh, like like doing inlines on your piece or something like that would be like a late night nineties, early two thousands kind of thing, and maybe it doesn't hold up anymore or something like that. But I think I think it's it's the ability to look at something that you've done from a long time ago and maybe see it from a set of fresh eyes and and see the the validity in the work. Uh, and I've and I've enjoyed like. Sometimes like I'll come across something I haven't seen in a long time and see something in it that I'm still, that I've evolved in my present day. I'd be like, oh shit, that's pretty good. Let me, and I, <laughs> I'd take a screenshot of it and I'd be like, you know what, I'm gonna use that as a reference for later because sometimes we do things and we forget about it. Yeah. You know, like there'd be something that we just be so fast, like like uh, obsessed over and then it just, morphs into the next interest or, or whatever it may be totally. and and for all of us i mean we're we're talking about our origins and in, in graffiti um starting in the 90s you know for me it was the early 90s uh you know uh, 90s and what about you 96 96 um you know we're talking about uh you know a, a commitment to graffiti going for us, uh, 30 plus years and, and approaching 30 years. Um, and there's a lot of people that have come in and have left graffiti in that time. And it's, uh, and, and all of this, I think uh, the interest of it began before the concept of street art, you know, which is the big, you know, um, one that, that really lures in, you know, mainstream people. Absolutely. I think it's very interesting to hear these perspectives because you guys rode this wave before the internet, before the popularity of street art, uh, it's, and, and you've stuck with it through all of that. 
and evolved along with those movements. Um, I, I wonder if you guys could share some of your general impressions about the way the internet has affected you and your craft and, uh, and how you feel about that. Can I jump in on this one? Yeah, please. <clears throat> um, I think that, you know, I think with everything technology, there's like an upside and a downside to it. Usually you end up losing some stuff along the way when some new technology comes about. But I think that probably the biggest loss for me as far as graffiti is concerned is just the um, kind of homogenization of like regional styles. I think, you know, back in like the 90s and the early 2000s, you know, like when we were doing Paint Lewis and Scribble Jam, it was kind of like a gathering, you know, for the entire country where people from the West Coast, the East Coast, the Midwest, the South would all kind of converge in St. Louis or Cincinnati or wherever. And they would bring with them kind of the flavor of like where they came from. You know, I think there's very distinct styles that were like incubating in Chicago that were vastly different than the stuff that was happening in Miami or Texas or, you know, wherever. Um, and I think that was really cool. You know, I think like just within those little um, ecosystems, there would be their own kind of history and people that sort of passed down these legacies of style that would kind of all ferment in this one area or this one region. And you don't really see that as much anymore because everybody's just looking at Instagram and stuff. That being said, I also think it's kind of cool that, you know, like you see merch and those guys that are doing those vertical pieces in LA and it's only a matter of time. I mean, I've already seen like my guy shock from Minneapolis. I don't know where he, he did, but I think he did one somewhere in, so I think it was in St. Louis actually recently. Was that you know which one I'm talking about? I've seen oh. it. I don't know where he did it. But like that's a whole new frontier. He like did that's it on, that's he gonna did happen it everywhere Instagram. within you know the next six months. It's gone viral. He did what? He did it on Instagram. That's why. <laughs> <I was doing. laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know where it was. You know, like like these like repelling vertical pieces. That's like very LA from the last three months basically. But it's gonna be everywhere. You know, for sure. Um, so I saw one in New York. Oh yeah. Swan hit one in New York. Okay. <laughs> that was one of those ideas I had, like probably the first three months of doing graffiti, like, oh, it'd be cool to repel that. But then like some point I was just like, oh, that's insane. Like, that's a really stupid idea. Nobody's going to do that. There's and, a few, there's a few people that have been doing it over the years. Yeah. Uh, it's just nice to see people within our crew sort of taking it in another direction you yeah know, bringing um, rams bringing bringing like a like an msk kind of aesthetic into that yeah uh there were some people like in in new york i seen the guy xsm uh do some and um a, a couple of other fellas that would do more kind of readable ones uh and and people from our crew have done readable ones but it's it just really interesting to see um people approach it in, 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 in more of a variety of ways. Um, yeah, but, but that's, that's the lovely thing about graffiti is that we keep figuring out um, uh, new ways to expand on the idea of it. You know, uh, and, and a lot of it comes down to the, the tools that we include into the process. And, and, and this would include uh, repelling instruments and all that kind of stuff. I think the internet does tend to destroy regional identities and scenes and cultures, but raise the bar as a group because everyone pays attention to the mm -hmm. same feed of information. Yeah, it's it's in, it's inevitable uh, that that all of our interests, uh, um, it like before before the internet, before the internet, um, in graffiti there were magazines. And uh, you would, some of these magazines would come out if they were, if they were fast, they would come out every three months or something like that, you know, and uh, it, there would be people that like in, me included uh, that people would send photos 
to the magazines where people would trade photos back and forth to each other. And that's how you would come across what's going on in other places. And then there was also videograph and this, these kind of things. Uh, but there was a criticism similar to the internet before the internet where people would sort of uh, uh, critique other people of saying, oh, their stuff looks like that they're influenced by what they're seeing in magazines. Mm. You know, that, that they're taking uh, something that they saw from this person from Massachusetts and this person from LA, this person from Chicago, this person from New York. It, it, it just, it's just influence. It's just simply influence. Like I think that for some of us and even the generations before us, their interests were literally, what somebody said before, like, like crumbs. Like just little tidbits, like the the opening intro of, of "Welcome Back, Cotter," or or or, or um, you know something that they saw in a music video or something like that, and that's all they needed to get on the path. Uh, but now we we live in an age where it's it's very accessible, very easy, um, and that's fine. It's just going to. Uh, it's there and, and, and it's, it's going to continue to become more accessible and more easy. And all that we can do is, is figure out our own relationships with technology, never mind graffiti, but just the addictive nature of, of having the whole world in your pocket that's radiating possibly harmful energy into your body and creating, tu and creating tumors in, in our legs. Or, or wherever, or just the obsessive nature of staring at uh, screens. Uh, to me, that's that's more of a concern than if people are influenced by this guy's arrows from another part of the world, you know? <laughs> yeah, I feel like, uh, I think like the broader the market, the better. Because 25, 30 years ago, if you said you were gonna be an artist, it was like, how? Like, are you going to Yale? Like, your parents have money? Are you a black sheep of the family? Like, you know, and now the market's so broad because of the internet. It's amazing. It's almost too broad. It's so oversaturated. But you got to take one with the other sometimes, you know? Um, I mean, it's easy to game, right? Low-hanging fruit kind of stuff. It's not necessarily like that artistically... Uh, uh, intellectually stimulating or it doesn't have anything to do with graffiti or art or expression nothing organic but it's like people can game it you know but that's just part of it I think like you just kind of have to take it with the good and the bad I think the one thing about the internet that's weird is it just makes like like taste ubiquitous which isn't really taste you know it's like everyone's like kind of like Frankensteining their taste but it's like you know you look at you go out and everyone has Botox you're like everyone <laughs> like everyone needs this like you do uh, but you know it's just part of the programming I think I think that was the cool thing about graffiti was like it was your own programming so right off the bat you were trying to not imbibe the Kool-Aid so to speak and like it was really selective was really selective like everything colors styles where you painted, how you painted. Oh, I only paint the freeways. Oh, I only paint uh, billboards. Oh, I only paint trains. Oh, I only paint uh, yards. Like it was very, it was very like thoughtful in its way, and I think that's like a training for like how to manage taste and how to manage like media and how to manage like uh, being caught up in this wave of like biomass. You know, we're all like a giant entity, our phones included. You know the cybernetic organism yeah and uh, you know it's it's just trade-offs i think everyone should do like a cool off period with their phone you know whether it's a day or you know turning on an airplane or something try not to look at it first thing in the morning I agree. but uh, Agreed. I, think it, I think it's good it's, it's good it's but i mean graffiti would have gone nowhere and the rest of culture and visual art would have gone nowhere without the internet <clears throat> it's everywhere now like all kinds of things that are like we're like sequestered to tiny little like interest groups of maybe the uber wealthy or like the uber educated or like they're not broad like you go to the broad and it's like so many people are there so many people from every different walk of life like tourists from germany kids from south central like whatever you know they go where the uh, broad yeah it's that museum up there 
the Broad Museum in downtown LA. Sorry. It's a Sorry. it's a private museum started by this billionaire named Eli Broad. Yeah. It smelled Brody. like broad. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of street art and stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a yard. You can just go paint it. I'll take you later. <laughs> go. He ran on the Frank Gehry or whatever it is. Mm. But I don't know. I, I think that's interesting. I think that's the internet. I think it's like the group sync, you know? Shout yeah. out to the internet. Shout out to the internet, man. I mean, well, just generally, my outlook on the internet is it's, it's a tool. It could be used for good or it could be used for bad. Like, people can overconsume and you know waste their days away or you know you can use it to produce uh content and then within producing content you can that could be both good and bad you can get lost in the comment section and as it goes back to your previous question about like people thinking like what's what what's good like i think all of us are like you know good enough to deflect negative perceptions but not good enough to like build up our egos if if we're getting praise so it's like i think that the internet is 100 percent a balancing act and like in general in life just put blinders on to other people's perceptions and just create goals for yourself and drive forward i think as far as the internet too one of the things i just thought of was I, I enjoy having been on both sides of doing graffiti pre and post internet. One of the things I think that, you know, some of these younger kids have never experienced was like going to a hardware store and looking for different aerosol products to take tips off of or hearing some rumor about how you can make a regular stock tip, a fat cap with a hot needle, you know, all these dumb little like technological things that people had to like actually experiment or like, like you were saying, Tyke, like mixing the paint colors with a WD-40 straw and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of that stuff kind of got lost in the shuffle because you can just order everything online and uh, Amazon will deliver it the next day. You know, you can get caps and every color imaginable and, you know, it's more consumer uh consumerism kind of killed a lot of that just the actual exploring how to acquire your materials and stuff like that and i i think some of what you lose with that is just um there's like creativity that that goes out the window when you can just buy everything and it's ready made learning how to make your own like stencil tip or make a marker out of a deodorant you know container shit like that like kids aren't doing these days because you can just buy the you know the mass-produced alibaba version of that for way too much money you know so i think that's like another downside but you know well there, there, there's the perception that if it in order for it to be done right or the right way you have to do it with the product mm. uh, It'd be like with, with food and food products. Uh, I had to get past the mentality of, of, th of, of my food coming in a box uh, mm -hmm. or having uh, ingredients listed on it uh, to be able to be resourceful and, 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 and uh, creative, like to, to create my own bread or to create my own um, um, improvised recipes. Um, yeah. Would, would you be getting? Would you get food out of the, the barrels and store it in bags? Or I don't know. I, I, I like I like the inventive inventive nature of uh, of, of preparing food for yourself. Uh, it, it it's 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 more than the food. It's 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 the relationships that you um, that that you have with the food and and and, and make it, taking it from from a series of ingredients to a finished product. Uh, It'd be the difference uh, for us uh, in, in the studio practice of stretching your own canvas and gessoing your own canvas and um, sanding that canvas and uh, putting that energy and intention from raw materials to um, knowing everything that went into the surface. Uh, you know, it's it's a different relationship than if you go to Blick and buy it buy a canvas. It's a different relationship, um, and there's levels to that. There's depth to that. Um, 
I I very much enjoy the improvisational spirit that comes from graffiti and I I still apply it to my studio practice. I I enjoy finding any way of of applying marks with with uh contrasting energy and intention uh, uh, and and sewing it all together into one piece uh, it doesn't have to be a fancy instrument it could be anything uh, so i'm always on the lookout for that and i and that part of me hasn't died the the resourcefulness that comes from my years of of working with limited uh materials um, that, that brings to an interesting point. I would love to hear the four of you speak a little bit about your studio practice and how, how uh, essentially explain to me a little bit about how you go about, about making your fine artwork in the studio and how does that differ or, or relate to your graffiti practice? your mark making practice or why don't we go in a row okay we'll start with you trav <laughs> yeah well <clears throat> my my studio work is kind of just me kind of documenting the world as i see it i see a lot of um you know with internet and technology pushing box stores out of the landscape um i've i don't know why i was drawn to this and you know more recently i've kind of like pinpointed it on my history coming up kind of shoplifting I, I made a living going to stores and also like through graffiti and like you know before cell phones and that we would meet at certain locations so like you would kind of like you, you would kind of navigate the city through like meet me at this landmark or that landmark and 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 that so like i always had a relationship with like signage and and you know commerce and typography from these things and as I kind of got into making paintings, um, I was just making them at first. And then the more I kind of like sat by myself and, you know, found myself like listening to like podcasts on commerce related topics, I kind of understand that there was a shift going on and it made me want to make work about the subject matter of, uh, of buildings and brick and mortar space being affected by the internet people shopping at amazon and these sorts of things so um i i want my work to kind of reflect that like juxtaposition of both classical kind of signage with a, like a digital kind of aesthetic so that's kind of the way i make work is kind of based off the push and pull of these two themes and you know and, and in terms of painting like I use skills uh, in the studio that I learned from painting graffiti, like in terms of like filling something in a 3D, like overlaying, not being happy with it, improvising, these sorts of things. And um, yeah, and, and for me, it's just it's just an adventure, like not necessarily like knowing what the end result's going to be and just finding my way and navigating my way to it. And, that's what I love about doing it is the exploration of it all. Mm. Mm. Um, in, in the past decade, I've went through a lot of effort to understand my relationship with, with myself as an artist uh, showing in, 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 in a gallery setting. Um, taking my my uh, energy and enthusiasm for graffiti and 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 putting it um, on square surfaces canvas or, or wood or whatever it may be and i've gone through a lot of different phases uh but it all kind of culminated to um making labor intensive paintings indoors um in, in, in a practice that was like highly technical that combined anything that uh, any processes, any approaches that I found interesting. Uh, and I took influence from everything from graffiti to silk screening to tattooing um, to uh, computerized illustration, all those different things. I just sort of applied it into um, 
my my painted work uh, and a lot of that work I, I was exhibiting uh, in New York and in um, in France uh, and then when I had a two-year ban uh, from Europe which I'm st still in in December I'll be allowed to go back to Europe um, when I ended up here I you know I spent most of COVID uh, sort of locked in my studio and then I just couldn't take it anymore. I was in a basement studio in Paris and couldn't tell if it was day or night out, uh, was away from nature. And I just wanted to be outside. And I went to the countryside and started making paintings outside. And I, I said, Ooh, I like this. I like the idea of just being outside in grass, uh, and painting. I would like to do more of this. So when I ended up in America, I just wanted to travel across the country and paint outside. And, and I think that's one part of graffiti that um, kept me interested was that it was an excuse to go be outside and do something. Uh, if anything, graffiti writers were like, like punk rock plein air painters, you know, like, uh, like we go outside, we take whatever resources, whatever tools that we can sort of carry in a bag or a backpack or whatever. We go to a particular location that, that we are not normally operating in. We work for a, a limited amount of time and we leave. We document it, we leave. Uh, so I, I developed a desire to bring that process into my venture as as a as a gallery showing painter uh, so i started traveling across america seeking out places that i felt held energy or were interesting or just me being in that place it would it would give me a uh, emotional response uh, so i started making paintings in places like where jfk was assassinated or at the grand canyon or uh, in some national park beside a waterfall or something like that um, in this show i made some paintings with guns uh, i'm not a gun guy or anything like that but you know uh i like the idea of of expressive mark making being able to sort of uh have uh kind of like music different sounds juxtapose in rhythm some of them uh intentional some of them not but in the end uh there is some sort of balance um ask how you use guns in your mark making process so i went to home depot and I got myself some aluminum um, three foot by three foot surfaces. I called up my boy Adrian, who's former military and zeroes all his weapons really well. And uh, we went to a shooting range and we sort of set them up in different places. I try to cover some areas and expose other areas. I angled them. I thought about like the the trajectory, whether I'm shooting up or down and um, rigged it with like hanging spray cans or other types of tools. And I realized that there is the ability to compose there. You know, the more you do it, the, the better you, you, you can get. You can use lower caliber weapons for like details, higher caliber weapons for explosive kind of energy you know and then and then i would i would shoot paint a little bit shoot again and paint a little bit and then it, it's it's a process it's it's an intuitive it's 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 a it's a open it, it, i just let go i just trust that it's going to get resolved one way or another there's a painting that i did in the show that i did with uh with my mother my sister-in-law and and my nieces and i just was telling them go ahead and paint all right, yeah, go ahead, do an expressive mock there, do that, do that. And then took the canvas and just made some adjustments to it and boom, it's a done painting. You would never think that like, you know, little three and four year olds did the painting, you know, but I like, I like taking things that are not normally, or, or, or uh, paths that are not normally taken, going off the path a bit and then just sort of finding your way in that. Um, and, and, and that's what I did. I traveled across America. I made paintings outside. 
uh, in some really difficult conditions. I was in uh, I was in uh, Roswell, New Mexico, and it was just too hot to paint outside. And I was at Bottomless Lake State Park, and I just waited until it got dark out, and I put a little little headlamp on my head and I went down by the lake and was watching shooting stars and all that and made a painting at night you know and and from coming from graffiti we we're, we're, we're masters of painting in in low light situations or under pressure or whatever the case may be so I'm bringing a, a variety of scenarios and circumstances into the process in in a collaborative way collaborative way yeah, that sounds and I had fun. Yeah. And I got to see a little bit more of America to understand sure who I am. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, what was the question again? Um, I, I was studio asking, practice. Uh, your studio practice. <laughs> I was going to ask too. <laughs> a, a bit about your studio practice, uh, the, the thinking behind your, your fine art, uh, what it means and, and how you make it. So, so I find graffiti when I'm like 15, 14, around there. And shortly thereafter, you know, I'm extracting resources from the landscape and of those resources there's also acrylic paints and canvases and paint brushes and I'm painting graffiti pieces with paint brushes and they look like naive outsider art paintings and uh, you know I have friends come over that aren't doing that and they're like what is that and I'm like what's art and they're like what's that and I was like it's the same as graffiti it's just like you know it's painted it's you paint it outside and you paint it inside it's like he was painting everything and they're like why would you do that and you're like oh it's just, you know show it to people and you can move around and like same as a train or you know it's like this is forever or for a bit of time and and uh i just did that forever like i've always been painting uh and i i don't i don't see any difference between the categories other than like it serves a purpose to have categories for like the lay person or the uninitiated but for me it's all just human expression and really at its core it's engineering and it's how to do something and people you know you meet people and they're like oh I'm a mechanical engineer and you're like cool good for you I'm an engineer too and they're like <laughs> I'm like there's only one thing you can work on it's called pattern recognition they're like you're right because <laughs> material sciences are just material sciences you know? um, and so you know engineering is a form of wizardry right you know how to build a bridge you know how to build a painting you know how to build a 3D sculpture you know how to do something in CAD and extrude it. And um, so I, my practice is the practice of just learning how to engineer different things. And some of it's with paint. Um, and then I, you know, I, I study, I do a lot of, you know, self-education. And that's so why I got into some people. And, you know, about 15 years ago, I was reading Duchamp. And he's talking about, you know, ready-mades. And I'm like, what's a ready-made? Well, it's a red can of spray paint. That's a ready-made. You know, like Tyke, when he makes it, he makes his own color. So that's not a ready-made. That's, that's something he made. And so I start thinking, like, well, all this paint I'm using is it's just standard. So it looks like what everyone else is using. So, like, what if I get some bucket paint and mix the colors and now I have my own thing? And I start doing that with my studio stuff. And then I, you know, same thing. It's like, why, why, why appropriate this canvas that's, like, already wrapped? Why don't I just get a roll of canvas from, like, a wholesaler? it's raw like, you know maybe I don't want it just so maybe I want it matte medium and I want to use the canvas I just want to make an outline of the canvas or maybe I, I don't want to use a spray can maybe I want to use an airbrush or maybe I, I don't want to use that at all I want to use an HPLV and a compressor and then you what's sure HPLV? high pressure low volume what is that? it's a certain type of paint gun but you got to make sure the inlet and the outlets are right because if you have the wrong compressor it won't shoot the right around so it juice. really blasts it? Uh, it's how cars are painted. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. like an airless is a form of uh, HVLP, mm. but not really. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but and I use all these different tools, and then I start making screen prints about 15 years ago. I have a studio mate who went to CCA, and he's a print major, and uh, he teaches me how to screen print. And I've been screen printing and mark making, and I started using that like in a form of painting. Um, so like the traditional like screen print, like on your T-shirt. You know, there's a lock layer, there's a fill layer. And that's a three color print, it's a cool print. It looks even cooler when you wear it, right? But uh, I start doing this thing where it's like, it's an analog kind of generative process where I'm just taking shapes and colors that I make and making transparencies and just layering them over each other and you're getting these fields or these lenses of color 
and they're making colors that don't really exist. When you go to take a picture of it, the, the sensor on the camera can't pick it up. And so it's like, it's only visible if you're in, in front of it. And so I like this in the age of the internet, you know, um, it's like, I make art that's really hard to photograph. Yes. Uh, and so people don't know until they see it in person and then they're like, what is that? And I'm like, <laughs> it's not on the internet, bro. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, as I find myself going towards things that are like hard to see digitally. And then I go in the other direction and I go, oh, but I make everything digitally. I, I start with a pencil drawing and then I'll, I'll make a drawing in the computer and then I'll chop and screw it and then I'll color it and then I'll spit it out and I'll project it. And then that'll kind of just be like a script, but it's not a movie. So I'll have to paint the movie into it. And um, I just do, I do all kinds of different stuff because I'm interested in, in, in materials and I'm interested in uh, how they affect the way we see things because light is just a reflection. It's like a vibration, right? It's like hertz or frequencies, or not hertz, it's a frequency. And so like when you're trying to take a picture of a red painting on a red background, like you can't get it. Mm -hmm. Or you try to take a picture of a red painting with like red transparencies and it's white. It's like, it's the frequencies are like outside of the camera technology. And so like, I'm super interested in this stuff. And so I just, I'm always going towards materials like uh, Venetian plaster where it's like, you take a picture of it and it looks like it's wet and then you look at it with your eye and it's mad. And you're like, what's happening? And, and uh, I just, I spend a lot of time doing that kind of stuff and just kind of exploring like what, what I can engineer more than like, can I come up with a, a recognizable thing? You know, I kind of, I, I think like I'm interested in that story, like the Tower of Babel, not because I'm religious, but because like, you know, it's about like disconnected humanity. So like, if you look at my work, there's a lot of humanity in it, but it's completely disconnected. And uh, I, I, that's like my favorite part about like making stuff because it's not a job where I have to like show up and oh, I'll have to make this four by five for this person who wants it. And it's like made to order, like I'm making a Big Mac or something. You know, I kind of just like make stuff and it finds its places and it's real whimsical. And, you know, and I've been doing that forever. I love that about your work too, that you know what it is from your early sketches and maybe several different viewers could see many different things within the process yeah. and, the, and the final product of it. Yeah. I also think we're like living in this diaspora right now of like digital images where it's like everything is just like it's just like uh, photocopied so many times over that like there, there's just so much source material out there. It's It's wild. And then you know like I'm here in LA right now. I'm taking pictures of all the all the landscape, and it's like an old sign with graffiti on it. And like, but it's just like, oh, there's just so much like in the skyline and like the sunset. And it's like, there's just so much visual information. It's it's fascinating. But that's basically what I do. I'm like a, I don't know, I'm like an explorer for visual information. You know, I'm like on some Indiana Jones, like in the Temple of the Lost painting kind of thing. Where I'm always just like. I, I'm like over here looking at this this falcon in the in this hand, and then I'm looking at this wasp nest up here, and I'm like, how do we correlate those two things into something right now? You know, like I don't know, but I'm, I'm just I work overtime on that stuff constantly. This is kind of like uh, you know, like, uh, how my brain's. Feel. The falcon mascaras for a reason. There are a bunch of falcons that live right on this block. Nice. And they attack and kill pigeons and rats all the time. I just saw the shadow of them. Yeah. <laughs> they are active out <laughs> here. <laughs> it's incredible to see them and kill a pigeon. I saw a big ass rat run by the steps down there. <laughs> Southside falcon. Yep. Yep. South Central falcons. I like it. I like it. That's really cool. That See, that like just changes the whole... You know, like there's like a whole world you can mine right there. It's great when you see the falcon perched on some barbed wire here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, to, and to link all that back into graffiti, I think it's like, it's just no rules. It's like no context, you know, like you make the context. Like, uh, yeah. You make the rules. Yeah, you make the rules. There you go. I love that. You set all the parameters. It's a, it's an experiment. It's an, you're an engineer and a scientist all at one time with it, with it. Yeah. I mean, it's your responsibility to see it through. 
What about you, George? Do you have fun painting? Mm-hmm. At times, yeah. I mean, I, I must because I keep doing it. Uh, as far as my studio work of late, I've been focusing a lot more on uh, just making abstract pieces. And I think the main reason for that was I, I started primarily as like an illustrator. And so there's elements of illustration in most of what I do. And because I obsessively like to work everything to death and just fine tooth comb it and detail it out to the nth degree, like if you give me enough time, I'll just keep going with every piece I work on. But I, I was finding like when I was doing oil paintings and more figurative stuff, um, it was really hard to finish paintings. The first 70 percent goes relatively smoothly. And then when it starts looking it starts taking shape. I start getting more and more like tight about should I do this? Should I do that? And uh, that final 30% takes probably three or four times longer than the first 70%. So a lot of times I'll just get kind of lost in it and I uh, like get frustrated with not being able to just like bang it out and I'll start a new painting. So I'll have, you know, in my studio, I have like endless unfinished paintings. And a lot of times it's like a temporal thing where it's hard to come back to something you were working on seven months ago because you're not on that frequency anymore. You're on something new. So doing these abstracts was a way to kind of make completed works that I didn't have to overthink them too much and try and break myself of some of those patterns of just over detailing, overworking everything. And that's been kind of a maddening process because still a lot of those instincts start rearing their heads in my abstract pieces as well. I mean, I kind of set it up in ways to make it harder to obsess over every little thing. Like one of the things I've been trying to do a lot more is um, is make the tools I'm using a lot more clumsy. You know, like I used to do these like intricate like micron drawings and I'm trying to do the opposite of that. Use like really crude tools where I'm not exactly, I'm not surgically making these marks. I'm kind of just guiding them and like, there's a lot of chaos in the mark, but I'm guiding it in a general direction. And whatever happens along that path is what happens, you know? And I think because so much of it is left to chance, it's not like I'm pouring over every centimeter of the, the, the canvas or the, the surface. Um, I started making these brushes where I would just take a piece of cardboard and I would kind of cut like a little fringy tassel to it. And I would dip that in the paint just cause I wanted to get these really uneven, you know, like rather than like drawing every little crude misshapen line, I, I can make these lines that kind of generally f- create a direction but each segment of that paint is like unique and different and kind of there's like, it's almost like a randomizing feature to the, to the process. So what I, what I've been doing is taking a lot of these random crude tools to kind of establish areas of texture and then kind of like, I would say collaging them or editing them down to like, I want to keep this little weird nuance that just happened um, maybe get rid of these ones, keep this one and, and just keep building it up that way. But a lot of my tendencies to overwork stuff are creeping back in. So it's constantly like a balance of control and lack of control that I, I want to find the right ratio of that, that yields some good paintings. So that's where I'm at at, at the current time. Well, I, I, would, I want to thank you guys for giving me the time of day and, and uh, sharing your perspectives on this. It's a real privilege to, to hear from you and to work with you here. And uh, please, if you're in Los Angeles during the month of September 2023, come and see the collaborative show between these four amazing artists, Uncommon Bonds, opening on September 9th from 7 to 11 p.m. and running until September 30th. Uh, the gallery is open every day except for Monday, and uh, you really don't want to miss uh, this beautiful exhibition from these four artists at Super Chief Gallery. 
And if you feel like talking anymore, I did want to ask you guys if you have any messages for a younger generation of kids that are into graffiti and looking to transition or make it in the fine art world. Yeah, uh, I say for en for anyone, uh, you don't have to be a kid for it. I, th I think that that spirit is inside all of us, regardless of our age. Um, I think that the important thing is whatever it is that you're doing. It should there should be some level of fun involved. Uh, it should it should hit you emotionally on some level and if it's not perhaps you're doing the wrong thing we should not be afraid to abandon something or we should not be afraid to destroy something in order to complete it and i, th I think that that's what what we tend to do is when i don't i again i don't i don't give up on any of the work i do i resolve it but i'm not afraid to just throw a bowling ball at it uh, to knock some things down and just go some other way, you know. Uh, if if you can't if you can't connect to what you're doing emotionally, do something else on that and finish it. Yeah, yeah, love that. Yeah. If you're not having fun, destroy it and and keep trying. <clears throat> destroy it, but don't give up on it. You know. Uh, like do something exciting on top of it. Sometimes you just you just throw a real excited mark on it, you know, and laugh at laugh at it, you know. The painting you were doing downstairs, you said you covered a previous painting. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, just stay interested. I think I think there are many ways to stay interested in being alive, um, being creative, and exercising our imagination is is super important and staying interested in that process uh, is key. I think also tap into yourself, tap into your history as a person, you know, stay the hell away from like trying to produce what other people are producing. Mm -hmm. These sorts of things, they kind of go without saying, but simple perspective for me. Be yourself. And also, thank you for having us. Yes, I appreciate yeah, thank, it. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome.